Hello everyone and welcome to the Ramen Otaku Show. Today is a very special episode as I'll be reviewing the Rockman EXE anime. Or, as you Americans know it as, Mega Man NT Warrior. So yeah, this is actually the very first episode where I'm reviewing a big name video game anime series. Not counting Fate Stay Night. So I'll be going over the highlights, what I thought of each season as a whole, including the movie, and why I think this series has managed to stand the test of time and be beloved by millions of people. I'll also be comparing not only the games, but also the manga itself since I also finished it. And before I forget, I'll be using the Japanese names for the characters since I watch all of this in Japanese, and legit, this, this entire series takes place in Japan. Anyways, with all that being said, let's plug in! In the year 2000, with the advancements of science, mobile phones, and the internet were becoming extremely popular in Japan. Japanese people were using mobile phones way more than Westerners for how advanced they were. From taking photos to accessing the net, they were about as advanced as the smartphones that we use today. Fast forward a little. Originally, the dev team at Capcom were tasked with making a horror game, but due to difficulties, the team was then shifted to making a new game paired with the Rockman brand, and decided that the theme would be cyber networks rather than robots to connect with the modern audience. After being inspired by not only Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, but The Matrix, Digimon, and Shaman King, the team created a brand new Rockman JRPG series for the GBA called Rockman.exe, and would follow the same path as Pokemon, which not only includes games, but an anime, manga, and toy line. At the time of Battle Network's development, Capcom had approached Studio Zebek, the same studio who produced the cutscenes for Rockman 8 and X4. They needed the studio to produce an anime series to coincide with the games, which is the anime that we'll be reviewing today. And that's all you need to know about this cyber version of Rockman. So there are about five seasons and a movie, and they all adapt from the games. And I use the term adapt very loosely because this series does make changes to both the story and the characters, but still tries to keep them true to form. Some of them are great, and others don't make sense, but let's go over what is adapted within these seasons. The first season is an adaptation of 1 to 3. Network transmission sort of counts into this, but not by a lot. After all, this game is supposed to take place between 1 and 2, and is inspired by the anime. The second season, Access, is an adaptation of 4 while picking up the remaining pieces from 3 and uses net nabbies from network transmission. The third season, Stream, is an adaptation of 5 while picking up the rest of 4 with the duo arc. The movie is a true, albeit a compressed adaptation of 5, as it focuses on Nebula Grey. It's been theorized that this movie takes place between episodes 22 to 29, but I think it takes place after 23 if going by the release date. The fourth season, Beast, is an adaptation of 6. And the final season, Beast Plus, adapts the rest of 6, Network Transmission, and Phantom of the Network. So, no Battle Chip Challenge or Legend of the Network, unfortunately. First, I want to talk about male and Sakurai's Japanese seiyus. While there are a lot of good saves in this anime, Neto and Mail are of course the big highlight in terms of voice acting. Neto Hikari is voiced by Kumiko Higa, who would later go on to voice another blue hero in 2008, Thomas the Tank Engine. No, I'm not even kidding. This is very fitting, as both characters are very popular with children and have very similar personalities. And since I watched the Japanese dub of Thomas and Friends back when it was available, every time Neto speaks, I can't help but hear my early childhood icon Thomas. Thank 
るトーマスだよ But overall, I really enjoy Higa's performance. And then there's Mel Sakurai, who's voiced by Kaori Mizuhashi, who would later go on to voice Kuki Shinobu from Genshin Impact. While there are some aspects of Mel that are similar to Shinobu, it's a little surreal hearing sweet Mel and the seriously strict Shinobu. ブブ、サブローは第1条と第2条を同時に破った。またこの事例は第2条36項目の補足説明にも当てはまる。罰として、あんたら全員今の問題に関係する条目と規則の詳細を3回ほど書き写してもらおうか。So yeah, maybe don't think too much about this. Or maybe do! Okay, to be real, I highly doubt that there are people who grew up watching Thomas and Friends and play Genshin Impact like I do. So, with that out of the way, here's what I appreciate about this anime series. I like how they expanded and fleshed out a majority of the characters in this series, like Masa, Sorama, Miyuki, Higuri, Mariko, and even the World 3 members. I love the romantic rivalry between Higuri and Masa as they competed for Mariko's affections just because of how funny it is. I enjoyed seeing the contest winners' nabbies appear on screen as they would leave their mark on the legacy of Rockman, and most of the comedic episodes, whether it be a curry battle or a cart race, were absolutely amazing. Even as the story progressed, I was invested with the plot. Now as I said with loose adaptations and changes, some of them are good and others don't make any sense. One change that I feel very mixed about is how this Rockman isn't technically Neto's brother, Saito. He is 100% a customized Navi. I assume they made this change because it was either too dark or complex since Saito died from HBD. While part of that depth is still missing, Neto and Rockman's brotherly relationship is still intact in this anime. Now let's get into my bigger gripes. First off, I don't like how they portrayed Pharaoh Man, aka Forte. So in the game, Pharaoh Man is a solo net navi created by Dr. Wily to protect World 3's secret areas. You fight him in 1, 2, and network transmission. And in the manga, he tests Rockman in a battle against four versions of himself using the style change until the Blue Bomber gains Saito style. But in this anime, he was created by Dr. Tadashi Hikari, aka Neto's grandpa and was supposed to function sort of like Alpha, but after being infected with a virus, he escapes until he finds Rockman and deletes him in the N1 Grand Prix Finals. After Feral Man self-destructs, he is then reincarnated into Forte, and from then on, he appears in the anime for only a handful of episodes, along with the movie, which I'll get into later. Overall, this Forte has been done dirty, and I don't like it. First off, this means that his creator, Dr. Cossack, is completely obsolete in this series, and that Rockman and Forte are technically related. And even with these weird changes, this Forte barely acts like the character we know in the games. There are very few instances where he fights his rival Rockman. The original Forte from the classic series was created to be Rockman's fierce rival, and the Battle Network games stay true to that, especially in the manga series. Ryo Takamisaki gave Forte a lot of love, as he is involved in every adapted arc since he's always a post-game boss. So seeing Forte be treated this poorly utterly sucks, and makes me wish they could have done a better job with him. At least in the movie, Forte was given a bigger role and did act like the character from the game, but I still think he deserves better. And speaking of Forte, I also don't like how they portrayed Lord Gospel, aka Shun Obihiro. Oh wait, Shun doesn't exist because Lord Gospel in this anime is actually a robot made by Dr. Wily. Now I get it, Wily makes robots, and I assume they made this change because it would be too dark to reference child abuse. So that's my big gripes with these changes. I don't know why they made them and it hasn't aged well. But who knows, maybe these were the decisions made by Keiji Nafune. So yeah, that's it for the first season. As for Axis, the one thing that they introduced that's exclusive to this series is Cross Fusion, where Net Navi and Operator fuse into a tokusatsu hero and can battle in the real world using a dimensional area, where viruses and Net Navis are able to run amok. This is interesting, as it brings a whole new dimension where the battles can take place between the real and cyber world. Well, mostly the real world, because I feel that they put more focus on the cross-fusion battles, but I guess that's to balance out all the net battles from the previous season. And the main threat is not just Dr. Rigo, but the Darkloids, 
who in this anime are not solo net navvies created by Dr. Rigo, but created themselves. That makes absolutely no fucking sense. Despite all the good things it brings to the table and the episodes that are worth rewatching, I found this to be the weakest season. I don't know why, I think it's due to how weak the execution of the cross fusion is and how it could have been better. But I'm not gonna dwell on that. We got bigger fish to fry than dwelling on the adaptation of 4. Now before we move on to stream, I want to talk about the English dub of this anime. Now look, I know there's a lot of people who grew up watching this show as they played the games, read the manga, and bought the toys. Heck, I kinda wish I grew up with this anime myself. But even if that was the case, even if I did grow up watching Mega Man NT Warrior back when it aired on Kids WB, I'm not gonna excuse these Americanization. They have aged poorly and just aren't worth watching today. More importantly, there are several episodes missing due to them either having Japanese elements or just not being suitable for American kids. Americanized anime shows don't age well, and I refuse to accept these changes. The only time, and ONLY time, I'm gonna accept these Americanizations is Sonic X, since the franchise was made for an American audience. By the way, I might do a review on Sonic X before the third Sonic movie is released. But, back on topic. I said this in my Smile and Doki Doki Precure review, and I'll say it again here. Back in the day, these localizations were made because companies felt that American audiences wouldn't understand or even enjoy foreign culture. In the 90s and 2000s, the internet was still primitive, and accessing information, let alone reliable information, was very limited. If you wanted to do a report on Japan, you had to go to the library and find books with the information that you needed. Nowadays, accessing that information is very easy thanks to our smartphones and the advancements of science. As Gaijin Goomba once said, today's science fiction is tomorrow's science. And with the US opening its invisible borders because of this, the world has become a lot more connected. That's why anime and manga are starting to sell way more than cartoons and comics, compared to back then when anime and manga was just overlooked or even looked down upon due to them not understanding such a foreign culture. So I guess we really do have to thank Dr. Tadashi Hikari for the advancements of the internet and mobile phones. It brought us together in a future where we are all connected. Now as for why they stopped dubbing, I can only assume that either interest for Mega Man was waning or just didn't want to deal with any more censorship. Maybe they had plans to dub Stream and Beast, as evident with the enhanced DS port of Battle Network 5 having voice clips, and this text from a Battle Network 6 trailer, but that's a big maybe. Okay, now for Stream, which I consider to be the second best, as it is an adaptation of 5, which is also my second favorite entry in the Battle Network series. And it is a slightly better improvement on Axis. So what has improved is that there are more cross-fusion users, like Roll, Searchman, Gyroman, Nightman, and Medi. I also really enjoyed Jasmine and Medi, plus the romantic rivalry with Mail and Roll. It's just really funny, and both of them are just that charming. And finally, the net battles and cross-fusion battles are more balanced out compared to Axis. So the villains in this season are Neo World 3, the Asteroid Navvies, and Dr. Rigo. So let's start off with Neo World 3, which is ruled by Tesla Magnets. I thought it was super weird that Tesla would start a criminal organization, let alone revive World 3. I mean, she was fine in Team Proto Man, but again, it was pretty weird. Eventually, she would redeem herself in her own way near the end of the season, so I was at least happy that she didn't get arrested or die being evil. <laughs> Then there's the Asteroid Nabbies, which are distributed by Slur, the messenger of Duo, who looks like a Pokemon mixed with Knights from Nights into Dreams. And I believe this fucker was implemented in place of Serenade, since both of them don't have a gender. Slur distributes these navvies to humans who have selfish desires, and then it pretty much becomes Doki Doki Precure, with the message that they're trying to tell. And it's true! We all have selfish desires, and we can't truly erase the evil within us. But that's just what makes us human. And it's only then that when we learn from our mistakes and do the right thing by helping others is what truly makes us righteous. Now with all that being said, the unfortunate part of these navvies is that they still feel like Axis is Darkloids, 
in which Rockman and friends have to fight the Navis in cross-fusion battles. Which doesn't feel like an improvement. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad they gave these Navis operators, especially the ones who didn't have any to begin with in the games, but I wish they would have gone a little further with the idea rather than simply retreading access. Like, if the asteroid Navis forced their operators into cross-fusion, where the Navi takes over the operator's body, that would have been more interesting. In fact, I could imagine a scenario where some of the operators are trying to break free and regain control, while others are in full sync with their Navi that they're beyond redemption with their selfish desires. But no, too much work or whatever. And finally, there's Nebula. But first I want to talk about Dark Rockman, who in this anime is a separate Navi from Rockman, but still shares the same data. Sort of like in the manga, as opposed to the game, who is Rockman infused with the Dark Power. I think this is the best version of Dark Rockman, because in his last episode, he sacrifices himself to keep Slur busy so that the main trio can confront Duo, and then rejoins with Rockman as Data again so both of them can be with Neto. It's pretty sad! And then there's Dr. Rigo, back again with a fucking beard, and wants to take control of Duo all for himself. I find it impressive that this fucker has been defeated not two times in the game, but three times! Unfortunately for him, he ends up dying, and the same thing happens in the manga. I find it extremely ironic that the anime has gone out of its way to make these silly changes just to keep the kids happy, whether it be shedding a new light on Princess Pride instead of making her a tragic villain in the game, or just giving this dumb, ugly bitch Aneta some redemption after what she did. And yet, they decided that Dr. Regal should die instead of redeeming himself in the game, since his father, Dr. Wily, regrets not being able to raise him properly. But nope, he's got a beard, this fucker needs to die, end of story. I really don't know what the mindset was on that. But overall, this is the reason why Stream is the second best. It does have some improvements, but it still feels like it's retreading access. And now it's time for Beast, which is my absolute favorite season, as it is an adaptation of Battle Network 6, my favorite. You'll also notice that there are fewer episodes in comparison to the previous seasons, as the focus is about the Psybeast and the Beyonder, which is an alternate dimension where Dr. Wily actually succeeds in taking over the world and is now planning to take over Earth as well. I actually appreciate the fewer episodes, which made getting through them way easier. Now, I praise Battle Network 6 as my favorite entry in this series for how the story felt like it was done not only in the same spirit as the first three games, but also the first season of the anime. And that's sort of true with this season, as it does rehash some elements of the past. The absolute highlight in this season is Iris, who is a combination of the game and manga where she is both mysterious, soft-spoken, and serious. The major difference in her that I absolutely appreciate is that she got to have a happy ending where she lives instead of sacrificing herself and Colonel. Iris! Oh, my heart. Iris! You're so adorable! While Beast may not be 100% perfect, I absolutely appreciated this season for what it was able to do and how it ended. And finally, there's Beast Plus, which is an aftermath season where the episodes are more comedic and about 10 minutes long. This is due to them sharing a time slot with a CGI Ape Escape anime. But I also think it's because they wanted to move on to Shooting Star early. By the way, I will do a review of the Shooting Star Rockman anime once the Legacy Collection for that series is released which I'm 100% sure that Capcom is working on right now as I'm making this video. And if not, then Capcom, you have failed me as a company and have forced me to take matters into my own hands! Now, even though the episodes are shorter and just have smaller arcs, I enjoyed them a lot even though I never got to play Phantom of the Network, since this, along with Legend of the Network, are no longer available to play since they were released on Japanese mobile phones. I really enjoyed the Zero arc, as it felt like they were trying to make up for how they treated both Forte in the anime and Zero in the games. And even when Zero sacrificed himself, it was really honorable and felt like they did him right. See, here's the funny thing about Zero.exe. In the robotic timeline, Inafune hails Zero as one of his greatest creations, and is beloved by millions of fans within the Rockman series. But in the network timeline, he is completely ignored and never seen again, even when he is spared in network transmission. I'm glad Zero got to shine in this anime, but it's too bad he'll never be united with Iris. WHAT AM I FIGHTING FOR?!
Okay, maybe that was a little too intense, but still. Next, I enjoyed Captain Kurohige and Chiro's antics as they try to defeat Neto but end up failing, which felt like the original World 3 from the first season. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Ropto and Nyundo. So were you expecting these four idiots to team up and try to take down Neto like in Battle Network 6? Well, too bad because that doesn't happen in this season. Ropto and Nyundo operate on their own, and it's really ridiculous. I mean, it's still true to their source material, but I wish they tried to take down Neto together, whether it be in net battles or cross-fusion battles. What I enjoyed about the lackeys was that they felt like the original World 3 members, but with a twist. And that twist is that they betray Wily to start their own criminal organizations. But, nah, we're not gonna do that. And the finale to this whole anime series was really good, as they take down Cash and save the world from being turned into data. The ending may not be as perfect as Battle Network 6, but it's nice enough to end on a high note. So how did this spin-off series manage to last this long? Well, there are three factors that I think made Battle Network such an amazing series, where it was able to stand alongside Pokémon. Number one, it was using the recognizable Rockman brand. And when people think of Mega Man, they think, Oh, Mega Man? I know Mega Man! He's that blue guy who jumps and shoots a lot! Essentially, they think of the platforming hero that he was back on the Famicom. This is in contrast to Yo-Kai Watch, where it was an original IP causing people to be wary of the unknown. And I think Western people were still hesitant to learn about Japanese culture. There was also Shin Megami Tensei's Devil Children, but back then Shin Megami Tensei, let alone Persona, was still relatively obscure in the gaming community like with Fire Emblem back in the GBA. Rockman was a strong, recognizable brand that Capcom had and was able to achieve what Mario was able to do, if not a little better. People know who Rockman is and are willing to buy the game if it had Rockman slapped on it. Number 2, The Relatable Aspects In Pokémon, you are a 10-year-old trainer who goes off an adventure to catch all the Pokémon, beat the gym leader, blah blah blah, I legitimately don't care. There really wasn't much relatability to this, let alone the anime. In Battle Network, you play as Neto Hikari, who is a 10 to 11 year old boy going to school and solving problems caused in the cyber world. He has a lot more relatable aspects to children than Ash ever was, since Neto was made to be your typical elementary school kid, but still keeps true to the spirit of Rockman. He still has a strong sense of justice, and isn't gonna let the world crumble. I'm sure Ash has that, but I'm not gonna bother checking. Yokai Watch had those relatable aspects, and yet people threw them away because of how prideful they were, as well as not being able to understand Japanese culture. I can only assume that the toxicity of Pokémon was responsible for this. Another aspect I should mention is how mobile phones and the internet were being used, especially in Japan, which was only a pipe dream for Westerners back then, since the technology wasn't as advanced as what we have today. The fact that Battle Network was able to utilize that technology as a theme makes it more realistic than Pokémon. And number 3. Pokémon is about being a completionist to your own detriment. Collect all the Pokémon, get the gym badges, and be the best. While Battle Network doesn't encourage you to be a completionist, it isn't the main focus. It wasn't about collecting all the battle chips and being the best. It was about saving the world from an evil threat. Whether it be a terrorist organization, an alien giant, or a legendary beast, Neto and Rockman risk their lives to stop the villains and achieve everlasting peace. Pokémon does have a villain force, but do they ever attack people? Battle Network stays true to the heart and soul of what Rockman truly is, which is being a hero. Going all the way back to classic, Rock was just a normal robot kid who assisted his creator Dr. Light to build industrial robots. But when Dr. Wily was causing harm to society, Rock wasn't just gonna stand by and do nothing. He was willing to risk his life to stop the mad scientist and protect innocent lives. And even when he battles the robot masters, deep inside he feels bad for destroying them. That is what makes Rockman truly shine, and that is still present here in Battle Network. All of these three factors are what made Battle Network an amazing series that was beloved by millions in the 2000s. So while Battle Network may have had games, an anime, and a manga series, as well as a toy line, and etc., it is not by all means a Pokémon ripoff. It achieves what Pokémon isn't able to do, that I think a majority of people tend to overlook being a relatable hero. So there you go, that is my entire review of the Rockman.exe series. The anime series is sort of a mixed bag, but the seasons I enjoyed the most are Stream, Beast, and Beast Plus, and as for the manga, I mean for as limited as it is with its story, it's pretty good, and if you love Forte, I think you will absolutely enjoy it. 
And while there are some people who wish for a Battle Network 7, I think this series has reached its definitive conclusion. But I would like to see a brand new successor to this along with Shooting Star, as both series feel pretty outdated. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see after they release the Shooting Star Rockman Legacy Collection. So there you go, that's my entire review of this massive anime series. I hope you enjoyed it. So, I shall see you all next time when I review the Shooting Star Rockman series. Until then, bye bye